Sunday, we're, we're back at the track, and by now, we are total fans of the surfers. You know, we're just waiting for final eliminations. Um, who was it? Warren Coburn won the second day on Sunday. Yes, they did. Right? Yes, yes, they did. Um, and uh, so Ron and I decided we're going to take more pictures. Um, so we go back to where the cars are getting uh, prepared for the final event. Um, and again, I hopped over the fence, and I took this picture of Mike Sorokin getting ready. This is that's a my wonderful favorite. shot. That's a wonderful shot, shot of you Mike. Know, I mean, the lighting is and, great, and all the guys behind him—it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great shot. Dump lock. I wish Tom Joke was in this one, but he wasn't. Um, so, um, got this shot of Sorokin. You kind of see the tension on his face because he's mm -hmm. getting ready for the big one, the final event. Yep. Um, I also took this picture of James Warren getting ready for his. Unfortunately, he he wasn't facing in my direction. Right. But um, still a fine color shot. Yeah, and yeah, you know. and shows beautifully in his flame suit how tall he was. Yes, too. Right, tall yeah. He's a tall mm -hmm. guy. So they push the cars off, and Ron and I had to make a decision: where are we going to watch this final? You know, and we we're halfway between the start line and the finish line. And I said to Ron, "You know what? Why don't we run over? Because there's a lot of people at the starting line. Why don't we run over to where the finish line is? Maybe we'll get a good shot of the winner there. Where right. it's going to be." Go. So Ron and I ended up down there and we're waiting and the, the, the cars get pushed off and they kind of disappear off into the distance and they make their turnarounds like a half a mile away. You can barely see them, you know, and we hear the engines run and turn around and it gets real quiet. Uh, and then all of a sudden, here they came, right? And just the surfer's car just showed up, came out of nowhere and he pulled ahead all by himself pretty much. I think Warren... Red lighted? Yeah, uh, he yeah he wrote. He red lighted, and then he yeah. had some mechanical problems. Yeah, right. Okay, mm -hmm. so the surfers are coming in our direction. They they he, Mike Sorokin takes it through the lights, and I, in my mind's eye, I can still hear those parachutes pop out, and the, the car slows down, uh, and it's rolling in our direction, and it's bumpy back there, and the car would hit the road, and it would right as he's coming to a halt, and he comes to a halt right in front of me. Now, there's not a soul around, just Ron and me and that camera. Nobody else around for, for a half a mile, nobody. And Mike pulls up right in front of us, and Ron, I gave Ron my camera, and I said, you, you take a picture of me. Uh, and Mike, the engine is pinging, it's cooling off. Mike starts to take off his straps, and I marched up to him and stuck out my hand. <laughs> and Ron Gustafson, 17 years old, my best friend, yes. caught it on film. One of the most iconic photos ever yes. taken at Famoso. Absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Gorgeous. Now, reflecting back on this moment now, it, it's kind of like, you know, there's just three of us in the car. It's kind of like when you're in a kayak on the ocean, all by yourself, nobody around, and this whale comes out of no place, and you have this moment that you share, you know, where you're really making a connection, but you just know it's not going to last real long. You know, yeah. and that's what that felt like. Shook his hand, and you know, then thirty seconds later, here comes a caravan of cars and push cars and people on motorcycles and hooting and hollering. Right. And the the moment went away, but sure. it was it was still there. You know, for that brief moment, you know, Mike Sorokin and I were just buddies, <laughs> and it was just the most awesome feeling. Of all the people that were there, you experienced the first handshake. And that's the first handshake, you know. And, and of course, I had to do the same thing for Ron, but I was, I took his picture, but I was shaking. I was so excited. And so, so I it's a little blurry, shot. huh? It's very blurry, unfortunately. Uh, this is Ron and Mike, and at this point, the others hadn't yet caught up. Um, but shortly after this shot was taken, everybody and his brother showed up, and I took this last picture. Mm. I think this is Don Pietro. Don, Don Prieto, on the Prieto. Motorbike. yeah, right, the sure. The wave maker. Um, the wave maker, yeah. And curiously, Mike Sorokin, he seemed very subdued. I mean, there was he wasn't jumping up and down for joy. He just kind of looked a little chagrined and shy, and like it hadn't struck mm -hmm. just yet. Uh, so, you know, that night we went home with a camera. We had no idea what was in the camera. All we knew is we had a couple of rolls of film, you know. And it wasn't until we had them developed uh, that we realized we have some pretty cool pics. Yes. We then tucked that film away for 35, 40 years, 
thinking, well, that was just an event that happened. I had no idea that there would be any interest in these pictures today. But then about 1998, I saw an article in Hot Rod Magazine, so this is like 35 years later, uh, on the surfers. It's the Cole Coombs article? Coombs. Cole yeah. Coombs. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic article. A fantastic yeah. article, you know, and, yep. and I, I remembered the event, and I remembered the ride on the fender, and so I wrote a, a letter to Hot Rod Magazine, and I told them I was there, and this is what the surfers did for me. They didn't know anything about me. I was a spectator, a 17-year-old, and they gave me a ride on their push car on the, one of the most important days of their lives. How cool is that? These guys are totally first class. Mm. And I sent out the hot rod, and they, they never printed it. Um, but Don Ewell did. I also sent it to Don after a while, mm. and I think he put it on his We Did It For Love website. Don Ewell, yeah. I think that's where the letter and the picture ended up nice. eventually. Yeah. Um, and that's where I ran across it. And that's where you found it, mm -hmm. right? So this would have been 1998 when I wrote the letter, um, and then uh, it things went quiet for, what, 12 years or so, till mm -hmm. about 2012. And then uh, I started thinking about the surfers, and I started thinking about Tom Job, and I read someplace uh, that Tom had gone to work for American Honda. Um, and it just turned out that my daughter Sarah was dating a boy whose dad works for American Honda. Uh, the, the man's name was um, Blank, Ray Blank, mm -hmm. uh, Cody Blank, I, I think it was like a VP of marketing. Oh. Um, and so Tom, Tom described him as the highest ranking non-Asian at American Honda. He was that a, sounds he, like him. He was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It was Got it. Ray Blank, right? Bud Blank? Uh, Anyway, Sarah was dating this boy, and uh, at one point I got to meet his dad, and I asked him, hey, there's this guy named Tom Job, used to have a dragster, and I'm told he works at American Honda. You know, you happen to know him? And uh, Ray Bud Blank says, yeah, he's my best friend. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> yeah. really? Yeah, small you know? world. And another small one world. of these surfer magic moments that just happen. Right, you know? Yeah. You know, and so I asked Ray, well, sometime I would really like to meet him. Can you arrange this? And he goes, yes, of course. Uh, you know, so that was the plan. But then my daughter and uh, Ray's son broke up, and that, that whole thing kind of went away. Right. <laughs> so this was in 2012. And then in 2013, about June, I get a letter in the mail from uh, some guy named Higginson. That guy. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, right. That guy. <laughs> and it was... It, it was a letter and it was a note and it said something about, yeah, I'm a big surfers fan and be interested in this picture, you know, I would like to contact you. Um, call me here. Yeah, I saw that Franz lived just a couple miles away and so I figured, you know, we can just get together and hook up. Um, but I never heard a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, initially when I opened this, I thought, uh-oh, stalker, threw it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? sure. Yeah. Um, and then I started thinking, you know what? What if that's for real? You know, here's a chance maybe to get to meet the guys. I knew Sorokin wasn't with us anymore. Maybe I could meet Tom and, uh, and Skinner. Um, so I, I fished the note out of the, um, out of the trash can and uh, I called you. Mm -hmm. right? And the next thing you know, Bob said, well, the, the, the old dragster guys have this event at Fuddruckers in El Toro where they have lunch. It's hamburgers. the uh, 1320 group. And about yeah. every four to six weeks, they have a little get-together. Yeah. Sometimes in San Diego, sometimes in L.A. Yeah. This one happened to be in Orange County and real close to me in France. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so Bob said, you know, the next event is on the state. Uh, why don't you come on down and you can meet some of these people. Uh, and so I showed up and there was Bob and there was Tom Job. You know. And, I mean, I was over the moon. You know, finally you get to meet the guy who was probably responsible for the ride on the fender and uh, I shook his hand and we sat down and we had a hamburger and I finally had a chance to ask him, why? Why did you do that? You know, I mean, I was just a spectator. And Tom said, he sees that whole drag racing scene as kind of its own little ecological system and it has to have three components. It has to have racers, participants, and it has to have an organizer and it has to have fans. Right. And he appreciates all three. So he said, you know, when I saw you running, he's kind of trying to recall this, when I saw you running, it just seemed like the most natural thing in the world to do, to 
come and join the party, come and join in the celebration. Uh, and I told him about Ron who took the picture and, and he said the only thing I regret was that we didn't have Ron on the left fender. <laughs> <laughs> okay. hmm. um, so from there, you know, Tom and I, uh, we just had a wonderful time catching up and uh, what, a, what a gracious sort of a, a fellow he is. Um, you know, Skinner wasn't available at the time and since then has, has passed away. Yes. Um, <clears throat> But it, here I'm having hamburgers with all these people that I remember from 65 years ago. These were my heroes. You know, these were the participants, and I'm sitting in with this group. And it's an odd, odd feeling. Um, but drag racer guys from the 60s are so cool. You know, they'll come and join us. You know, and yeah. I got to meet Ivo and McEwen. And I think Roland was there that day. Yeah. Roland was there that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Danny Bersari. Good, good group. Yeah. And so... At one point, I got a little confused, and I spoke to Rod McCarron and said, Rod, I, I don't understand something. Explain this to me. He says, these people were folks that I just worshipped when I was 17 years old. Yes. And they're talking to me like I'm one of their group, yes. like I'm one of them. Right. You know? It doesn't make any sense. Why? And Rod told me, you know, um, that event, Bakersfield 1966, is now known as the biggest drag race of all time. There are hundreds of pictures of the start of that race. There's one of the end. Right. And it's this one here. <laughs> yes. He said, that picture is a, a memorial. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes. And you have to feel good about taking that so many years ago. And, 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 and yeah. all this time has passed. And so, you know, it start, kind of started the click. And the next thing you know, here's Bob building a surface rail. And, right. you know, I've met you guys. Yep. And uh, I'm... I'm just amazed. Now, you know, there's folks that will tell you there's a great circularity in life. Yes. You know, and yes. uh, things that we used to do will come back and we get to revisit them. You know, and I used to be kind of a skeptic, uh, but um, I'm becoming a believer. You know, <laughs> yeah. stuff like this happens. Uh, yeah. And you start to think, okay, maybe something, there's something to it. And, and there's no doubt that those of us who lived those days are now in the last quarter of our lives. Yes. Okay. So we don't have an awful lot to look forward to, but instead we seem to spend a lot of time looking backwards right. at the places that we've been yes. and the things that we've seen, the things that we've done. Yes. And when we do these things, you know, you can't help but think of that event, Bakersfield, 1966. That's something that's in that resume, and today it still makes us smile. Yes, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. These, these surfer guys were so cool, and they were such a big part of that history. And reflecting back today, it still makes us smile. And not just those of us who were there, those who've just heard about it. There's a great fan letter that surfaced, and I wish I knew the name off the top of my head. But it was a kid that wrote to the surfers, and he wanted a shirt. And Mike Sorokin wrote him back and said, I'm so sorry we don't have any clean shirts, but I'm going to send you my best used shirt. It's one that Mike wore, you know, right. mowing the lawn or whatever. Sure. And they sent it back to the kid, and this is our best used shirt we have, but it's yours. I mean, just the most gracious bunch of guys that right. ever went down Correct. the track. Yeah, really. And it's nice to be somehow tied in with all that. Absolutely. Um, so here we are, 50 years later, yeah. and the surfers still managed to make us smile yes. and to make us happy. And that includes those of us who were there and those of who, who have just heard the stories. Now, is there a more noble achievement for a man than to make people smile, make them happy? I don't think so. And the, no, the surfers, that's the legacy of, of Tom and Bob and Mike Sorokin. And they're still making us smile. Yes, so, agreed. Um, to those guys, congratulations. You know, you've left yeah. a wonderful legacy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but even to the players that are slightly off the main stage, you know, Jimmy Crosser and Mrs. Skinner herself, Tom has said many a times there would have never been any surfers without Mrs. Skinner. Right. You know, and, and even those people have contributed to the happiness we're experiencing today. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's the legacy of Tom Job and Bob Skinner and uh, Mike Sorokin. So, um, gentlemen, on a life well lived, congratulations. Thank you for the memories. Absolutely. And surf's up. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Now, now, I want to take us to what happened 
for you, your personal experience that happened that same year when you did what others did, which is so many young men, women, were drafted and went to the service and went to Vietnam.